Hello, in this video we're going to talk about Bohr's theory of the hydrogen atom. And we mentioned this in the previous video on quantum mechanics, that this was one of the mysteries of physics that led us to our modern understanding of quantum mechanics. So you take the light from a gas discharge lamp, so you take some hydrogen or some other gas and put electrodes and a high voltage across it, it'll start to glow. Send it through some slits and through a prism and you see these discrete wavelengths of light. So now we have the background that we need to be able to understand why this works. So, this is Bohr's model of the atom, early 1900s. Um, and the idea here is that you have a nucleus here, and then you have certain orbits around the nucleus. So this one here is n equals 1, this one here is n equals 2, the one out here is n equals 3, so on and so forth. So you have these different orbits around the central nucleus. And the hydrogen line spectrum can be explained if these orbits of the electron can only have specific energy values. And so for this simple model of the hydrogen atom, we give these energy levels principal quantum numbers, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and that defines the level. And it'll go upwards from that, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then you can calculate higher levels than that, but typically in reality, by the time the electron gets to n equals 8, it just leaves the atom. Okay, so the electrons are restricted to certain circular orbits around the nucleus, and that's the model. Now, no, this is an incredibly ridiculously simplified model of the atom. It only works for one electron. It ignores the unpredictability of the electron and the probabilistic nature of it. It's really a bad model, but it happens to explain hydrogen line spectra very well, so that's why we teach it. And it also is a good entry point into the better model for the atom. So do keep in mind, this is a horrible model for the atom, but it works to explain this one thing, and it's a good starting point for us. Okay, so the outcome of these orbits for the electrons is that the electron can transfer between orbits um, if it absorbs or releases energy. So say your electron is hanging out here on n equals 1. So if this atom and the electron absorb energy, the, if they absorb a specific amount of energy, it will shoot this electron up to a higher energy level, say from n equals 1 to n equals 3. There's a bunch of different options for energy levels and transitions, but here's the example. Okay, so then now if your electron's out here in n equals 3, it can then release that energy and the electron jumps back down to a lower energy level. So we have that written over here on the left, right? If it absorbs energy, it'll promote this electron, this is my little abbreviation for electron, um, from the lower energy level to a higher energy level, and that, you know, so when it went up, that term was promotion. All right, and then when the electron relaxes to a lower energy level from a higher one, or to better read the slide, when the electron relaxes from a higher level to a lower one, then energy is released as light. Now, since these are only certain quantized values of energy, you only get this one difference of energy that your photon will um, represent. So this means you can only absorb a certain amount of energy. Say you absorbed this much energy, well that's not going to work because there's no energy level out here for your electron to go to, so it just can't absorb that amount of energy. So it, can't, it also can't absorb this amount of energy. You have to absorb the right amount of energy. And then similarly, when the electron relaxes back down, it can't relax back down to here, there's no level for it, it can't relax just to here. So there's only certain values of um, energy difference that it can let go when the electron relaxes back down. Now electrons being kind of weird, they are in one level, say n equals 1, and then suddenly they're in the n equals 2 level. There's no point in time when they're in between the levels. They're just over here, then they're over there. Okay, so there's these allowed energy levels are equal to the Rydberg constant and n, which is the number of the energy level squared. So we have our definition here that we define energy relative to a free electron, so an electron just floating around outside of the atom, so that when this electron 
comes and joins the atom, that's favorable. So that means it releases energy when the electron comes to join the atom. And then here's the constant, named after Rydberg himself. I've always wondered if it's Rydberg or Rydberg, but pick whichever one you like and go with it. Okay, so here's an analogy to the whole process, right? Say you have an oddly shaped stairwell, and these little blobs here are your electron. Well, you can't be standing in between the stairs, right? You have to either be on one stair or the next stair. So it's an analogy to what the electrons are doing. They only have so many options. This weird shape of the stairwell does match reality. N equals 1 is going to be down here. N equals 2 is a much bigger difference in energy. N equals 3 is less of a difference. N equals 4 is less of a difference. N equals 5 is then less. N equals 6 is less. So this is the kind of shape you see. So then after de Broglie proposed the wave nature of an electron, it made sense from a casual point of view why electrons could only occupy certain energy levels. At a certain energy here, and remember energy is related to frequency, which is related to wavelength, at a certain energy and wavelength, your electrons can make a standing wave in a circular fashion around the nucleus, and that works. Whereas if you have a different wavelength, well, now it doesn't line up right, or this really doesn't line up, this doesn't line up, right? So if you've got the wrong wavelength and thus the wrong energy, then your electron can't land in this orbital, or this orbit, I should say. Um, so it's kind of a qualitative thinking reason as to why this makes sense. A couple slides ago we had our definition for the energy of a given level, but what we really care about is an electron transitioning between two levels, because that's what we can measure. That's the light that comes out of it when you hit it with a bunch of electricity in a gas discharge lamp. So if you take the equations for each individual energy level and subtract them to get a difference, well, you ultimately wind up with this equation down here. Um, and in my head I call this the Rydberg equation. Um, and it's the one we really use here. So it's kind of listed casually on the side of a slide, but this is the big deal here. And so what this says is the change in energy for when an electron jumps between two different orbitals is equal to this constant, the Rydberg constant, and then 1 over the principal quantum number squared for the initial orbital. So this is initial here. And then minus 1 over the principal quantum number squared for the final. And remember, principal quantum number is this, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, right? Um, do note this equation only works for atoms with one electron. And if you have a different nucleus in there, you have to change the constant somewhat. Um, so it's a really limited equation from a really limited model, but it tells us a lot about hydrogen. So we have all these options, right? Your electron, if it's in n equals 2, it can transition down to n equals 1. If it's in n equals 3, well, your electron can transition down to n equals 1, or it can transition to n equals 2. Right? If your electron's in n equals 4, you can go to 1, you can go to 2, you can go to 3. Right? So you have different options here for emitting this energy as light. And all of these happen when you put the hydrogen, at, um, hydrogen gas into a discharge lamp. However, the energies of the so-called Balmer series uh, where the electron ends in n equals 2, these energies work out such that the first four of them are in the visible region. So these are the ones we see. You know, these lower energy ones are in the infrared, the higher energy ones here are in the ultraviolet, and they happen, you just can't see them with your eyes. So we tend to talk about the Balmer series a lot. Not so much by name, but at least that's the one we use. Okay, some vocab here is the ground state is called n equals 1. Ground means lowest energy that you can get. You're hanging out on the ground. That's about as low energy as you're going to go, right? Um, first excited state is an increase in energy. The electron in a hydrogen atom is not normally up there. It's normally in the ground state. So if you excite it with extra energy, eventually it's going to come back down. Um, and then if you excite it up to the second excited state, which is n equals 3, then eventually it'll come back down too, either directly to n equals 1 or via the n equals 2 state. Okay, so this model we're talking about works for both emission and absorption. And I think I've hit on this before, but let me try to get it again a little more thoroughly here. So if your electron's in the ground state, which is where it will start, 
you can absorb energy up to, say, n equals 3. I just made that up. You could absorb energy to 2, up to 4, up to 5, right? You have these certain values of energy you can absorb. And that's absorption. And then you can have emission, 3 to 2. Um, it'll emit that energy that it absorbed as a photon of light. And then from there, it can go 2 to 1, or you could go straight from 3 to 1. you got options. So yes, yeah, so this model works both for emission and absorption, which is part of what makes it useful. Okay, so some slides I have on absorption spectra here is if you take a white light and shine it through some sample, and so again, white light has all the wavelengths of light, and if you shine it through some sample that absorbs um, some colors, or in this case it's an atomic sample, so it absorbs in these very specific spots. This to me looks like it's hydrogen. Okay, so it absorbs in these very specific spots, then you take the light, send it through a prism, you'll find these dark lines here. So now these are the energies of light in your white light spectrum that can be absorbed to promote an electron from you know any state up to any other state. So you see them as dark lines here. Turns out you can look at the light coming from the sun and you can see a bunch of dark lines in it that relate to the elements in the outer layer of the sun that are absorbing the light from the sun. Now, I need to talk about the sign convention here. So here's the equation, the big ticket equation from this video. And the energy that comes out, this delta E, the number is negative if the photons are emitted from the atom. Energy out, negative. This delta E is positive for the photons absorbed from the atom, or absorbed by the atom, sorry. So you have to apply the sign convention sometimes. If you know that the photons are emitted from the atom and you're calculating this, then you need to slap the negative sign on there. So this is really different than how your book does it. Your book, book always makes this delta E positive, then it gives you two equations, one for emission, one for absorption, and really all it did between these two equations is it just distributes a negative sign into one of them. So I think it's easier to start with this um, equation and then just learn the sign convention, and that matches some stuff we do later in the semester with sign conventions and energy. So I think it's a worthwhile way to go, and your lab does it this way as well. So just do keep in mind that this is different than what the book's going to tell you, but it's mathematically the same. Okay, so an example for how this works. Calculate the wavelength in nanometers of a photon emitted by a hydrogen atom when its electron drops from n equals 5 down to n equals 3. Okay, so you have to read the problem to figure out which one's ni, which one's nf. So ni is initial, so it says drops from the n equals 5, so you can throw a little i in there. Okay. Um, and then it drops to the n equals 3 state, so that means this is n final. So you can then put these into the equation. Here goes Ni, here goes Nf, and then remember to square them and put them in the denominator. And then plug the numbers in and you're set. When you do that, it looks like this. You solve for delta E. And this will give you a negative sign because this is energy out of the atom from n equals 5 to n equals 3. So it'll give you the negative sign if you start with all the numbers plugged in over here on the right. The trick is, if you go the other way, if you're starting with a wavelength and getting delta E and needing to solve for one of these, I should do this, and needing to solve for Ni or Nf, then you need to apply the negative sign manually if you're coming in from energy emitted and trying to solve for Ni or Nf. And we'll have some examples of this in the worksheets we do in class. Okay, but we're not done with this problem because the problem asks for wavelength in nanometers and we just found delta E, so we have more to go. So delta E equals H nu, H time, Planck's constant times the frequency, and then the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by lambda, so E equals HC over lambda, and if you want, you can rephrase it like that. Okay, and then you can rearrange this equation to solve for lambda, because that's what we're trying to do. And then, now, when you go from energy to wavelength, or frequency, then you need to drop the negative sign. Because all that negative sign is doing is signifying that 
your energy is either emitted or absorbed. And it's not really telling you about the frequency or the wavelength. If you left the negative sign in, you'd get a negative frequency or a negative wavelength, and those just don't physically make sense. So if you wind up with a negative frequency or wavelength, just take that negative sign off. It's only a convention that tells us about which way the energy went in or out. Okay, so we're trying to solve for wavelength. I got a little lazy when I made this PowerPoint, so here's H, C divided by, big division sign here, E. All right. Um, and you solve for lambda. Now, we need to get this into nanometers. We're in meters, so here's our conversion. So we use that. Remember, when you're doing this on your calculator, you either need to put this whole thing in the parentheses somehow, or otherwise make sure that it actually does the math you want. Okay, and then you get 1281 nanometers. And so that's how you would go about doing this kind of problem. So we'll have more examples uh, in the worksheet in class. And for now, that's what we have for this video. Thanks for your attention.